everybody. Welcome to our ETM Distinguished uh, Speaker Series event for today, March 11. And it's uh, my pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Eric Wickham today. Dr. Wickham's dedicated uh, nearly his entire 30 year career to helping clients achieve superior results by making better data driven decisions. He's currently working as an analytics consultant for Wikialytics LLC. And his previous experience includes working across a, a range of different industries in technical and leadership roles at Tata Consultancy Services, IBM, Schneider, Nor Norfolk Southern, and the US Air Force. Eric earned his MS and PhD degrees in operations research from my alma mater as well, Georgia Tech, and that's where Dr. Wickham and I uh, first met. He also received his BS in operations research and mathematics from the US Air Force Academy. He's an active member of INFORMS, having recently served as president and subdivisions council representative of the Analytics Society. He's an associate editor of the leading journal, INFORMS Journal on Applied Analytics. And he served uh, on the organizing committee for the INFORMS Business Analytics Conference for a number of years. In fact, he's also the general chair for the 2022 uh, conference for INFORMS on analytics to be held next month in April. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Eric Wickham. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, well, let me give you a little overview of what I'm going to be ta talking about today. It's probably going to be a kind of a different type of talk than you might be used to hearing. Um, as I've gone through my career, I've really focused on kind of practical advice to be successful. And I'm all for learning about technical things with math and data and so forth, but I won't be talking about those things today. I'm gonna to be talking about some other things around analytics and operations research that are really um, key that I've learned through my career to success. So the title of my talk, um, Practicing analytics in a target-rich environment has a little different meaning to my daughter, who happens to uh, work in the area of analytics. She works for a major retailer located in Minneapolis. And so practicing analytics in a target-rich environment means a little something different to her than it does to me. Um, let me talk a little bit about my path in my career path. Um, as Tim mentioned, I graduated from the Air Force Academy and having done that, then I was destined to go into the Air Force. But before I started my active duty service, I was had the opportunity to attend Georgia Tech. And um, my PhD was in an area of scheduling and I, it was actually fairly theoretical in nature, although there were some applications that I really focused on things like developing heuristics and um, proving problems were NP complete and that sort of thing. So um, I really enjoyed that. But when I then reported for active duty in, in the Air Force at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois, I started working on real problems. And so there were a couple of challenges that I faced. One is, from my academic programs, I hadn't really done very much applied work. A lot of it was learning things about, say, linear programming with A, um, B, C, X, these variables and data. But I, had, I didn't, hadn't really put that together with what is real data look like. So it was kind of a wake up call to actually start working with real data. But during that time, I really fell in love with real world problems. And what I found is that you know, they have all the challenges of looking at mathematics and, and data and trying to figure out how to formulate problems and solve them. But more importantly, they have aspects of working with people. So getting buy-in for making changes, making decisions and recommendations that people will accept and consider and so I, um, I found that working with on real world problems was very challenging because it had all aspects of, again, technical 
types of problems, but also these other people problems and hurdles that one had to clear. And I found it was very rewarding to be able to be able to see the results of my work in changing people's really lives and, and how they were making decisions. After I got out of the Air Force, I moved to Norfolk Southern, which is uh, one of the largest railroad companies in the US, a class one railroad. And so for about five years, I had exposure to many, many different types of problems that rail, railways face, very complicated environment with a lot of different types of resources that need to be uh, modeled and, and also very large scale operations. I left Norfolk Southern and moved to Schneider. This is not Schneider Electric, it was known as Schneider National, but it's uh, located in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and it's a large trucking company, logistics, intermodal brokerage company. And again, with many different lines of businesses and large scale in the transportation and, and logistics area, there were a lot of interesting challenges to be solved there. Um, after I left, Schneider, I attempted to strike out on my own. So I, I formed a company called Freelance OR. Um, and that was right about the time of the, the Great Depression. So my timing was absolutely terrible. If I had chosen a time in the last 50 years, I couldn't have selected a worse time to try to go out on my own. And so after about three years of trying, or I guess it was uh, 18 months of trying. I made about $32,000 and my kids refused to stop eating. So I had to do something a little different. So I joined IBM and IBM was really building its analytics business at that time. It was hiring a lot of people who were available and was really successful at having a team in place when the economy recovered. Um, my experience at IBM, as I'll talk about a little bit later, was very valuable for consulting skills that I learned and also just really figuring out how to sell myself and what it was that I, I could do for people. So I subsequently joined Tata Consultancy Services, which is an Indian IT company. Uh, it was a very interesting experience. I got to travel to India four times and worked with people all over the world. It was really helped me to, to really see um, kind of an international view of things unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. And then about five years ago in 2017, I had an opportunity to try again. So I formed another LLC. And fortunately, the economy was doing much better. And with my experience, especially in consulting, I really knew better how to sell myself. And so I've been keeping that afloat now for, for five years. Um, a lot of the work that I do is working with other larger consulting companies and helping them with various projects, but I've developed a few clients on my own as well. So that is where I am today. And what I wanted to do now is kind of just talk generally about OR and analytics in this area. So one of the things I'm gonna talk about later is um, professional organizations. So both uh, Professor Anderson and I have been very active in informs throughout the years, longtime members, and have benefited greatly from being members of that. So informs defines OR and analytics that has some common elements. One of the things is a focus on decisions. So we're looking at decisions that people make. We're using data, we're using analytical methods, a lot of math and so forth to help people ultimately gain insight and make better decisions. And I like to think of this at, in the chain on the bottom. It's like, if somebody makes a better decision, does that really translate into better results? Um, it may or may not. So the first thing that we do is we try to help people we identify decisions that are being made. We help to figure out how is it that we can inform people using our, our tool set to make better decisions. But decisions themselves have to be implemented and poor implementation can make even a good decision turn out poorly. Um, so implementation is very important. And then once the, the decision is implemented, action is taken 
then we achieve results which we can measure and, and decide whether or not we and how much value we added. So again, our focus is on decisions but we need to really recognize how decisions fit into kind of a little bit bigger chain that ultimately leads to success, not only with insight to make good decisions, but also uh, potentially assistance to, to implement those decisions effectively. So in a target rich analytics environment, and I've shared in the areas where I've worked and have seen this in a number of places. So some of the ingredients of that, one of them are complex, diverse, and or large scale operations. So um, in the case of, of Schneider, for example, I mentioned there's logistics, third party logistics, which is very different from truckload trucking, very different from intermodal um, movement and brokerage. So there was a, a re real rich set of different uh, types of problems, both in the railroad and working for Schneider, saw very large scale problems with you know, thousands of rail cars, hundreds or more of drivers that had to be um, scheduled and so forth. So just the fact that there's such a large scale makes it difficult for people to make the decisions that affect those operations. Um, now a second ingredient is that data is available. Um, this has really been an important development over the last number of years with the internet, with a lot of things that there is an unprecedented amount of data that is available in different applications. There's sensors that are now present that are collecting data as well. So in a lot of these areas, whereas the data used to be just manually entered and that's what you had, a lot of automated data collection is possible. And then also kind of related to these complex operations is that there's many different types of decisions that are being made. And that is how do we do something? When do we do it? Who's gonna do it? Where is it gonna be done? Um, those problems are, are really, Pre prevalent, the different decisions that need to be made. And then finally, uh, management support. So just because you have these other elements doesn't mean that you can be successful if you don't really have management that supports that. Fortunately, this is also an area where I think, especially with the ad advent of analytics, now some data science and some people are kind of lumping AI, machine learning, and so forth. There seems to be a lot of interest in it. And to the extent that there's been some success, there's um, support to invest money in the types of capabilities that we can offer. All right, well, let me share a couple of areas where I've worked where um, there's really kind of a target rich environment. So one of them is in the agribusiness area. and so in this sense, a lot of things we're, we're developing crops that can uh, produce yield in many different um, environments, even in drought or in wet conditions and so forth. So there's a lot of um, problems related to the genetics of the, cro the cr crops and also how those genetics interact with the environment. So that in of itself, very complicated thing. Um, there's a, a, a real pipeline that um, is developed from research, new product development um, to planning and sales. So once you decide on which products you're gonna offer, which um, is usually, I don't know, 10 year life cycle to, to try different products and see if they would be worthy of making it to the market. Then when you figure out things like planning, um, how much uh, product to produce, where to produce it. And then when you get into sales, deciding various things to support the sales staff as they, as they sell these products. And then in, again, growing the, the seed that gets sold, there's large scale operations and there's many, many different products. So you have to figure out um, which of these products are we gonna grow in which quantities. And it's, there's different crops as well, corn and cotton and um, 
soybeans and so forth. So there's a lot of decisions to be made in how to kind of focus on those different products and how much of each one to, um, to produce for the market. So in terms of um, R&D decisions, there are some products, they go through a variety of stages and you need to look at like what traits are being um, shown and whether or not those traits might be beneficial, like um, the ability to withstand drought might be one of the um, things that you're looking for in corn. Um, so you go through this series of things and, and decide which ones to promote and which not to promote because there's many different combinations of, of these products that you're trying to um, cross. And then um, when you get to the point of growing it, how much to grow, how do you price your products potentially for different customers, different prices. And this whole environment has a huge amount of uncertainty, both in the supply and the demand. And also the weather is really an overriding thing that pr produces a great amount of uncertainty. So you may decide that you need to produce a certain amount of, of uh, seed, but the weather may not cooperate and you may end up with far less or you may end up with more than you, you planned. And it might be that some of the products you have enough supply, but others you don't. So how do you look at things like substitution? Um, then the last thing is that in this environment, we only get yield data really once a year in general. There's a few places like in South America where you can grow multiple crops in a year, but generally you just get one set of yield data points per year. So you're challenged with a really small amount of data about trying to make decisions about what, what yield will be for, for different crops and in different um, conditions. So one of the applications that I worked on here is trying to figure out um, a portfolio for a farmer. They have various fields with different numbers of acres um, and by planting a mix of different corn hybrids, they can balance risk and return. So just like in a financial portfolio example, and in this case, what's most of interest is downside risk. That is what will happen if we have a very poor harvest. Um, if that happens one or more years, that could be catastrophic for the farmer. They may go out of business because of that. So how can we put together a portfolio that includes a mix of hybrids and will help them to reduce the probability that their downside risk will, that they'll, they'll um, achieve in the worst case, some kind of uh, poor outcome. So the approach that I used, um, unlike the kind of mean variance, which was developed by Markowitz, this is using something called a conditional value at risk and value at risk something you can research, but it seems to be a good um, way to approach this problem where downside risk is especially um, problematic. All right, well, let me talk about another problem rich environment. You saw that I worked for Schneider, I worked for Norfolk Southern, and I've done uh, a number of things in consulting area for transportation and logistics companies. So these um, companies have large operations and they they move over time and space. So you've got trucks and, and planes and, and other assets that are not only moving from place to place, but they're moving in time. And so you have to consider both of those things. Um, you have operations you can look at within a particular location. What do I do? And when I'm operating between locations, how do I handle that? Um, there's many different types of resources. There's uh, in trucking, there's tractors, there's trailers or containers, chassis, drivers. Um, in railroading, you've got locomotives, you've got uh, cars, you've got end of train devices, you've got the track and, and its capacity, and you've got yards. So there's just a huge number of different types of locations, resources, and, and tasks that need to be, um, that need to be 
run to make the railroad move. So you have questions like, where and when am I gonna do something? So that could be uh, sourcing items, like for example, new trailers, maybe where do, I, where do I send my trailers initially after I get some new trailers? Um, routing and scheduling of, of drivers or of trains, um, who is going to do something? So when you're looking at like assigning loads to drivers or assigning crews to trains, then there's a lot of different questions. And then, then how, how, how am I going to, to do something? So for example, I might look at what mode should I use for a shipment? Should I send it small package mode, less than truck load? Um, should I send it by truck? Should I send it by rail? Should I send it by ship or some combination of those? So one of the things that we see now is that the need for um, supply chain, transportation, logistics professionals, and those especially with analytic skills is huge. We're seeing you know, problems that were brought on by the pandemic and it's a really, I think, a, a, a great time to get into this area, very challenging time, but it's a very good time for people who have the skills to look at these problems. Some of the, um, the assumptions that we've made in supply chains over the last number of years are being questioned. For example, just in time, logistics produced um, savings in terms of the amount of um, parts and so forth that needed to be owned but we're seeing uh, auto plants idled because lack of chips and now lack of other types of even relatively inexpensive parts that are not available and are bringing the supply chain to a halt. So I suspect we'll see one of the things would be some more less just in time and some more of, of stocking certain types of parts to make sure that the um, factories and so forth can keep on operating. So one of the specific problems I worked on in this area at Schneider was called dray optimization. There's a, an intermodal uh, type of movement where a container gets loaded at the shipper and it gets trucked, we refer to that as an origin dray to a railhead. And then the container gets taken off of a chassis, which is wheels that it was trucked on gets put on a rail car and railed some long distance. It is um, taken off at the destination rail head and then delivered to the consignee, which is the ultimate receiver of the freight. So we have these truck legs on either end, which are referred to as drays. And if we look at a location, for example, Chicago, there might be multiple railroads operating there with different rail ramps. So we've got both um, some of the containers that are originating in the Chicago area being hauled to those rail ramps to be railed out. And we have other containers that are coming from other markets. They're gonna be unloaded in the Chicago market and then delivered to consignees that are in the Chicago region. So we have both inbound and outbound. We have a fleet of drivers. They start at different places at different times. And what we wanna do is figure out how to get all of these drays um, covered by the drivers um, in, in a efficient, cost efficient way. And involved in any of these transportation, there's a lot of potential empty miles that occur repositioning equipment. And that's reality, but to the extent that we can minimize that, that's, um, it drives cost savings, it drives fuel savings, it drives uh, savings in carbon um, con um, production as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna tur turn to some kind of, I think, pithy advice that I've learned over the years um, that I wanna share with you. So the first thing that I have here is, so when it comes to being successful with analytics, it's not just what you do. And by what you do, I mean things like, oh, do we use linear programming? Do we use simulation? Do we use AI, machine learning? You know, the, all of the, our tools and so forth that we are able to apply. That's what you do in analytics, but how you do it concerns a lot of things that kind of go around that. So for example, 
how do you frame problems with people, um, organizations that have problems? How do you select the problems that you should go after? Um, and, and then ultimately, how do we communicate with people? How do we, how do we um, define deliverables, define a timeline for delivering that, define a budget, get buy-in from people? So the bottom line is, being good at analytics, being good at math and dealing with data, that's all well and good and required. And I encourage you to develop yourself in that area, but you also need these kind of areas that surround that in order to be successful. One of the things that I've seen in going back to school, um, I think of all the courses I took and, you know, real fire hose of so many different things that, that I learned. And unfortunately, during that period, I didn't have time to really um, study some of the things that interested me or learn them uh, more than to get past a test. So what I've found through the years is that when you learn it, then you know it, that's great. So you have knowledge about that, but when you use it and when you really have to figure out how something works for a project in real time and you're, you're really pressed for time to both figure out how to do something as well as get it implemented, then after you've done that, you will own the knowledge. You won't just know it, you'll own it and you'll, you'll never forget it because it's, it's both learned out of necessity and it's applied and, and then that knowledge goes. So if you're if you're in school right now and you're you know drinking from the fire hose, I wouldn't worry about this, but it's it's really um, rewarding to take these things that you've learned and, and really get to the point of owning them. And I think it also speaks to the fact that in education, part of what we learn is not just specifically the, the knowledge, but we, we learn how to learn and how to, uh, to get the knowledge we need when we need it of things that we may never have studied and, and things are changing all the time. So we, we certainly need to be able to continue to, to learn. Um, but this, this kind of mother, um, invention is the mother of necessity. This, this is a great way um, to learn new things and, and really own them. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is, um, I think when I was in grad school and even for several years after that, I said to myself, well, I'm not a programmer. If I really wanted to do programming, I would have been a comp sci major. I was majoring in operations research, so I was focusing on math. But what I learned is that you really can't be successful with analytics and operations research without being a good programmer. So the more you can learn about R and Python and Java and also um, database skills, the more successful you're gonna be as, as an analyst. So looking back, I wish I had just said, um, maybe I'm not a programmer, that's not what my role is going to be, but I need to learn as much as I possibly can about this because everything I learn is going to be uh, beneficial to me. The next thing, as I mentioned, when I joined IBM, that experience was especially valuable to me in learning consulting skills. Um, I've worked inside of organizations quite a bit. And one of the things I've seen, unfortunately, in a lot of organizations, they, what I have in the bottom right corner there, they do stuff. So they're, they're doing projects, they're interacting with people in their business or in their organization, but they don't do it in necessarily a, a very um, organized discipline way. And doesn't mean that they don't deliver some value, but what I found is that by developing some of the discipline and some of the techniques that are used by consultants, that, that helps me to be more effective. So one of the things is project management. I don't just start doing something and not worry about 
when things are going to be done, how long it's going to take, but I actually take the time to construct some sort of a, a project plan and to manage to that plan and, and communicate with people about the progress that's being made. Um, on the right hand side, there you see proposal and statement of work. Again, inside of a lot of companies, the, the people who I really think are internal consultants, they don't, they don't say, oh, let me give you a proposal to do this work. They generally just start launching into it or they don't give a statement of work that says, this is what I'm going to do. Um, and really from a, a consulting thing, the number one thing that is the focus of a consultant is deliverables. What is it that you're going to deliver when? And obviously you need to think about those deliverables in terms of how they're going to add value for the client. Um, another, th another thing that's important in consulting, and I mentioned this thing about how um, you need to go beyond just doing things that are, you know, technical is managing relationships. So how do you establish relationships with people? How do you manage those things? How do you manage expectations with people? Have difficult conversations in some cases with them. Um, and then another thing I'll just mention before moving on here is this point about trusted advisor. That is another goal when you're working with people is that they invite you to the table when they're faced with challenges and when they're making decisions. Um, there's kind of the opposite of that is sometimes called a pair of hands. It's like, I want you to do this work for me because I have a group that does it, but we don't have enough people here. Just do what they do. So that's kind of a pair of hands, extra pair of hands to dig in. But those people don't necessarily get invited again to the table. They don't have, um, they're not sought after for their advice on how this organization should proceed, which problems they should um, go after, which approaches they should take. All right, the next thing is an important thing is focusing on decisions that matter. I had a um, friend a number of years ago that used to say, if I catch a million dollar fish, I throw it back because I'd rather find a $10 million fish. So which, which problems should we go after? Um, the, the bars that I have there on the, the bottom looks at kind of total value. So there's some strategic decisions. They're made very infrequently and yet they have a huge impact on an organization. Um, so for example, where should I build a new fab plant if I'm um, a if I'm a chip maker? Um, in many cases, though, there's decisions which have very small impact, but they're made extremely frequently. So this is true in the transportation logistics area. So every time I assign a driver to some work, I could have potentially assigned some other driver or I could have given them some different work. So if I'm able to do that effectively, I can save $10 here, $100 there. So each decision isn't necessarily a huge amount, but collectively, because these decisions are made so very frequently, then um, that can really add up and be something that will make a difference. All right, next thing is that. Um, a lot of consulting companies uh, array themselves into something called industry verticals. So there may be things like hotel and restaurants or entertainment. There might be transportation and logistics, um, manufacturing, and so forth. Depending on which consulting company you look at, they probably have their verticals defined a little bit differently. So when one is beginning... Um, a career, my suggestion is to go deep in a vertical. So in other words, um, learn some particular area and know it well, know what types of terminology is used there, know what types of problems are faced, 
the, the various concepts. So for example, if you worked for a railroad, you'd learn about how railroads operate. You learn about the terminology that they use to describe trains and blocks and so on and so forth. And you would not only have your expertise in problem solving and analytics and data, but you would also become somewhat of an expert in this particular industry. Um, as you develop in your career, then you can move into other verticals. Um, and the consulting companies also refer to a horizontal as some type of approach that applies across verticals. So analytics operations research are certainly in that category because they can be applied in many different industries. The problems are different, the terminology is different, but the applications of making decisions and dealing with data and so forth are really in common across all these. So not only can you, you don't have to practice these things in a single vertical, as time goes on, you can move into other industries. And one of the things that will benefit you is that you know how to come up to speed quickly. So you know how to ask, like, what are the terms that are used? What are the concepts in this new industry? Um, what are some of the problems that they face? And by knowing how to ask those questions very quickly, you can then translate what you've learned um, and apply these general techniques to other industry verticals as well. That's something I've, I've been really pleased to be able to do is to kind of move into some new verticals like agribusiness was certainly out of, um, you know, I did some other things in manufacturing area, a little bit in pharmaceutical area. Okay, so another piece of advice for you, as, as Tim mentioned, I'm going to be the general chair of this conference that's shown in the bottom right corner here that's gonna take place in, in Houston a little less than a month from now. Um, but I found that by joining in forums that, and being very active in that, that's been really beneficial for my career. Um, so in forums is not the only organization that professional organization that you might join. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is to find a professional organization that you can join um, and one of the great ways to get involved is not just to attend things. Um, I think if you think that you can just sit there and sort of absorb value, then you know, that doesn't happen when you're in the classroom and that doesn't ha happen when you're attending conferences and so forth. The way to really um, get value out of this is to receive, but also to give. So you can volunteer as an officer. You, um, the networking that you have is tremendous through, especially through volunteering, you'll, you'll meet many, many different people and you just never know when um, that network could come in handy in helping you to understand like, oh, what's it like to work for Amazon or what's it like to work for um, IBM? So um, in addition to those, the INFORMS offers a, a professional certification called Certified Analytics Professional that can be a good feather in your cap to put on your resume. Um, there's a, an associate, which is appropriate for people who are just graduating, but then there's a Certified Analytics Professional, which um, requires a small bit of experience, but then you're, you're able to um, to earn that and there's a test that you would take. The um, conferences offer, and, and there's also an online career center and jobs fair. So through Informs, you're able to interact with many, many different employers and have an opportunity to interview with them at, at the conferences. There's also a program called Pro Bono Analytics and I think this is a really good way if you have some time and you want to get involved. Um, some, some people get involved in like contests um, to demonstrate that, you know, they're good at analytics. They, they um, 
won an award or they they participated in like a say a Kegel competition. But the uh, another great way to develop some experience to put on your resume is to do pro bono work. So Informs can connect you with various um, nonprofit organizations who are in need of help and can benefit from analytics. And you can dive in, help them, and have something to show for it, both in terms of your experience and something to put on your resume. All right, well, that's what I had to share. And what I like to do is now to kind of open it up to questions here. Um, Tim, I don't know if you want to kind of facilitate that. I'd, I'd be glad to. And once again, thank you for the uh, excellent talk. The first question we have is from uh, John Fitzpatrick asking, when you became a consultant, did you have a mentor or other person to assist you? And how did you find that person? I think the, the first thing is that I've learned that people working inside organizations, although they don't typically call themselves consultants, they really should. They should think of themselves as internal consultants and learn that. So to the extent that you know, I learned from people within various organizations, I've had that. I think when I joined IBM, which was the first time I thought of myself as a consultant in that way, because I was working with a variety of clients and they were you know, they were third parties that I wasn't within, I, I didn't work for their organization. Um, I would say I didn't, I didn't really have a mentor, but one of the experiences I had was very valuable. So I worked on a project for two years, which is pretty unusual for a consultant. Usually you move on three months, six months, maybe. And I was on this project for two years and it involved not only people doing analytics. In fact, that was kind of a small part of it. It had about a hundred consultants from IBM on it. And I learned a tremendous amount from people doing consulting in other areas and from the leadership that of this project working with the client organization. So I learned a lot of really valuable things. So I don't think I've necessarily, I mean, I, I haven't had a formal mentorship program. I, I could certainly point to some people who have had a very positive influence, but I didn't specifically um, kind of seek out a mentor and have a mentor. So can you say what kind of project would require a hundred consultants in two years of IBM? I mean, that's a major engagement for a, a consulting practice. It was, you know, it was involved with um, using some sensor data from some very large equipment to try to diagnose um, problems pro uh, proactively with, with very expensive equipment. And so there was clearly some work used for analytics there in taking the data and developing some various techniques that could recognize these things, but then they were building also a, um, an application that could be offered, really an offering for the customers of this uh, large equipment manufacturer. So there were a lot of different areas that had to be covered. Um, and, and because of that, a lot of consultants, but a lot of different types of consultants, which was especially um, helpful to me to have exposure to not just people doing analytics, but people that have a lot of other types of experiences. Okay. Great. And, um, Brad Enos asked, what was your MOS in the Air Force and how did that shape your career goals? Um, well, the, I was a scientific analyst and that was really kind of an OR type of thing. I, I never really liked the the term scientific analyst because um, I didn't think it was very descriptive. But in the end, I guess OR has in some cases fallen out of fashion too. I think um, I tend not to use it. I tend to use analytics. So um, I, would, I would say that I kind of began in the Air Force doing what I ultimately did for other companies just with a different kind of domain for problems. And um, so it was kind of a 
seamless um, transition to use my education, you know, to, to address problems, not only in the Air Force, but then outside of the Air Force. So uh, uh, I liked your plug for the certified analytics professional. Uh, I was the second person in the state of Oregon to become a certified analytics professional. So uh, uh, people doing the graduate certificate here at PSU in business intelligence and analytics are really well aligned and prepared for sitting for the uh, CAP exam. I can say that having done the CAP exam myself. Uh, and the same is true for people in our Master of Science in Engineering and Technology Management. Uh, and so the CAP associate uh, you mentioned, uh, that requires um, that they have some educational background or other training to sit for the exam, but does not require work experience, correct? That's correct. That's the main difference between the two. You have to have in order to be a full-fledged CAP, you need to have uh, a letter from an employer that basically vouches for um, actual experience that you have over just a, a small number of years. I think it's uh, two or three years, if I remember correctly. So it's not like you have to do it for that long, but you have you have to actually demonstrate in in you know work environment that you're actually applying these things. So any ETM students or uh, graduate certificate students in that BIA program, I would be glad to try to help uh, um, with uh, your applications if any of you choose to, to go down that road. How many CAP members are there now? In, in I, don't, I don't know if I have a current, current number on it. It's in the hundreds. Um, uh, one of the, what they, they attracted one of the universities to actually sponsor their students and pay for their, their cap registration fees. So there you go. There's an idea for it. <laughs> well, that, that would be a good idea. We'd, we'd like to check on that then. Um, and you mentioned earlier that the, um, uh, before, uh, the talk that the, student membership in the analytics society is free if they get an informs membership yes you can think of informs itself it's kind of the umbrella large organization it's got around thirteen thousand members so you know how do you join uh, an organization that's thirteen thousand members and really get something you can attend conferences and so forth but informs has a number of communities that you can join and that is a good way to get plugged in with people who are like-minded and involved in an area of your specific interest. There's things in rail, um, airlines, there's um, marketing, there's, there's many different communities. There's also local chapters in some areas of the country um, and there's student chapters as well that, that informs offers. For students, um, if I'm, if I'm wrong, I won't be wrong by much, but I think that you can join in forms for about less than $40 a year. You have to get something from someone from your university that indicates that you are a student. And some of these communities offer free men membership then. If you're an informs member, you can elect um, several different community memberships that would be free to you. And again, I think communities are a good way to, to get involved and, and interact with people. I have a question, Professor, if you have a minute. Yes. Um, Dr. Wickham, as the question I have, we had, we took a class in decision-making and we have the models and we also have a previous speaker about the decision models uh, and how we, objective we come with the alternative and we have as uh, criteria to choose uh, what I'm interested in understanding the how we I could connect together the data analytics to the making the differentiation between decisions in your example when you were talking about the farmer when you help them figuring out which uh, land to plant which crop to mitigate the risk this data analytics inform the decision making process could you connect us the two processes what part of where do you use the data analytics in making the decision based on the framework that we learned from the class? 
I think I'm going to start answering your question using a word that's similar. You said framework, but I'm going to use the word framing. And I think that's, that's where you have to start. A lot of people hear about a problem and they jump in and they want to solve the problem. I would say be patient. Don't just jump in and start solving a problem. But instead, you need to kind of take a step back and say, what problems exist? And there's always multiple problems that you know, people face. And which ones should we go after? So when we talk about going after a decision, we have to think about, do we have data that we would need to help make that decision? Um, also, do we kind of have an idea of what method? We don't know, need to know exactly what we're going to do at that point, but we have to have some sense that, yeah, I think we could do some, say, some sort of optimization model that would look at these different alternatives and select a, a good one. So I think the first thing that really, when, you, when you're dealing with people is not to just say, oh, what's your problem? Write it down, start running to solve it. The first thing is to the extent that you can have a conversation, maybe a number of conversations with the, these people and try to identify maybe a number of different potential dis types of decisions that you could help with and then really honing in on which one or, or several that you, you might um, go after. Um, and then I think you can get to the point of, okay, now I know this decision. What I like to do is to think of kind of from the end of a decision. So I'm picturing somebody like, is it some application that they have on a tablet or, or am I going into a boardroom and, and kind of presenting some recommendations to them? So depending on what that looks like, what would, what would this decision look like? How would we present it to the person? So for example, a farmer, if we're saying, oh, these are the hybrids you should plant. So maybe that is on some tablet that a salesperson is going over and saying, here, we're recommending that you plant this field with this hybrid, this field with this hybrid and so forth. And then working back for it, we can start worrying about what kind of techniques do we use? You know, what are the characteristics of this problem? What data are available? What are the maybe constraints that might be there or other considerations when we're making this? So I think it's helpful. A, start with framing. Make sure before you start running that you think carefully through where you can help the best. And then um, I like this idea of kind of imagining from the end of what is this decision look like? What would it look like if I had a, a decision to give to somebody? How would I present it to them? And then I can think about how do I get to actually what is a good decision that I should present to them or, or a set of options that they might consider. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any other in the chat. I'll ask one question is, what did you think about the culture, organizational culture of Tata Consultancy versus IBM Consultancy? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yes. So first of all, IBM is a very international company. But what I found is that Although I interacted with some people, I think I interacted with some people from Australia and uh, maybe some people in Europe. I, I, I've forgotten exactly where, but it was um, it was not that international in terms of what I was doing. A lot of it was just domestic focused, um, even though, again, IBM has people everywhere around the world. But... TCS um, is, I mean, first of all, it's has a very Indian focus. So there's a large uh, amount of kind of culture that is brought to bear because of where, where it started and so forth. And um, I think 
I, I worked with people in many different countries. And so you, you really get an idea of things like, oh, time zones really matter. And I've worked with people from, let's say, the central time zone. And when I, when I talk to them, they say, oh, let's meet at nine o'clock. Now, I happen to live in the eastern time zone. So I just, I never bothered saying, oh, well, that's actually 10 o'clock for me. I just, I just kind of ignored it and said, okay, I understand that. But it says that a lot of us are not, not aware of even what it means to work with people in different time zones. And then it translates to a broader cultural thing about, you know, what people eat and what people, you know, think and the type of conversation that you want to have with people all very enriching, but also something that you need to, you know, to think about. So it's, it's, it's valuable to be exposed to that, but it also kind of opens your mind to what it really means to kind of work in a multinational company. Well, and on that note, I really appreciate it being, uh, uh, with you being on the East Coast right now, that means you're spending your Friday night with us at 710 at, uh, at night on a Friday night. So your time. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I've got my email address here on this last slide, and it's, you can certainly share the recording and share the slides with everyone. I'll provide those to you. And if anyone has any follow-on questions or what, what have you, I'd be happy to, to receive okay. those. I'd like to ask one last question is uh, that um, you're playing a leadership role in a major conference, analytics conference, and yet um, are the owner and operator of a small consultancy. That's I mean, doing the large analytics co uh, conference as a volunteer, um, general conference chair, that's probably not a paid position. And uh, um, it is the fruit of a lot of work that goes into it along the way and serving in a leadership role in the analytics society. Can you say something about what your volunteer roles and all that time and effort you've put into informs in the analytics society, how that fits into your career here and how you've made that decision to, to um, invest that time and effort. I've been involved with inform since 1990, I think was when I first joined. And I would say for a lot of years that I attended conferences and I interacted, but I was, I, I was involved somewhat, but but I had some constraints, um, a young family and so on and so forth. Um, but in, I think it was about 2014 when I joined Tata Consultancy Services and to date, I have had an opportunity both with a boss that supported my participation. And now, you know, I decide for myself that I wanted to participate, I can decide that. So um, I really went in whole hog and um, I, I was involved very closely with the Analytics Society for five years, including being the president, you know, vice president, past president. And um, I think I was the, the treasurer as well. And then I got involved with the Innovative Applications and Analytics Award. Um, I was very closely involved with that. And not only as a judge, but I also then in analytics leadership helped to negotiate with the sponsors, um, find new sponsors and so forth. And then um, I was on the subdivision council. So I'm saying all this not because, you know, I'm so great, but I, I met so many people and I was able to kind of prove myself. And so when they thought of, oh, we need a general chair for the next meeting, then someone suggested me. So um, this volunteering and the network opportunities are tremendous. In terms of my career, I think virtually everyone that I'm working with now in my practice is someone who I, I met through Informs. And um, I, don't, I don't have a website. I don't go sell myself. I don't do cold calling. I pretty much have a network of people who know me, know what I do. And I've been fortunate that they've kind of sought me out to do, to do the work. So um, I think, so, so having a great network is really helpful when it comes to wanting to be an independent consultant. Um, the other thing I'll tell you is having 
a little bit of a, a financial buffer is also helpful because it doesn't it sometimes take some time for things to work and you don't always get paid in a very timely fashion it can be several months in some cases before you get paid so um, but informs has definitely really made it possible for me to be um, successful in these last five years as an independent consultant. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, uh, I'm sure I share the sentiment with everyone else of appreciating your taking this time on a Friday night to join us. Um, thanks much.